on the western seaboard of Ireland, the cliffs of Moher loom up out of the vast Atlantic. A fierce panorama of water and stone. It's an awesome sight. Wheeling, screeching birds competing with the wind. But there was a time when there was no looming edge to the land. Sea and earth mingled in a vast tropical sea. Three hundred million years ago, in this place, tidal sediments were deposited in the ancient sea. Millions of marine worms left their tracks in the sediment. They became fossilized over the eons, and the layers compressed and consolidated. Rising majestically, 600 feet above the Atlantic, the cliffs of Moher were once at the bottom of that sea. The myriad layers stacked in these cliffs stretch many miles inland, and like the pages of the book, they are the story of Liscannor Stone. 12,000 years ago, the first megalithic settlers drifted down from the north and scratched a living here. Stone was part of their lives. For their early buildings, marking the boundaries of their small fields, they used upright stone flags to protect their crops and livestock from the fierce Atlantic winds. been a precarious existence on this coast. At the beginning of the 19th century, observers noted that the lifestyle hadn't changed radically from the earliest times. They fished and farmed, and they supplemented that income by collecting seaweed and kelp along the shore. It was shipped to factories in Scotland to be processed for its food and medicinal ingredients. But the weather affected the collecting just as it did the fishing, so the supply was never guaranteed. Otherwise, there was only seasonal farm work like haymaking and the small craft industries of shoemaking and blacksmithing. Many emigrated to America. The native stone flags of the area were still used in the stone walls, in the building of houses, and outbuildings for animals. There slowly developed a very small industry based on retrieving and selling the flags to the nearby towns and cities. With the explosion in public building works in the mid-19th century, there came a huge demand for natural stone. The beauty of Liscannor stone was recognized by visiting engineers and quarrymen. It was seen to be far superior in quality to similar English stone from Yorkshire and Lancashire. The big companies realized the huge potential of an unlimited supply of stone, coupled with cheap labor, to supply the demanding markets of the rest of the British Isles. Expert quarrymen were brought in to train the local laborers. Stone from this area was used in the Royal Mint in London and in the refurbishment of St. John's Tower in the old Tower of London. Demand was so high for Liscannor stone that the workforce rose to over 300 towards the end of the 19th century. The extraction of the stone itself, like all artistic skills, was a matter of combining a natural gift with long practice and experience. In its essentials, it hasn't changed. The layers of stone which have been exposed under the clay and turf have the wonderful patterns of Liscannor stone. When the bed is revealed, each layer is gently opened with wedges. Then it is levered with crowbars to the point where the flag will be broken out to its required size. The great skill is in lifting the flag without breaking it. The quarrymen listen for how the particular piece is coming out of its ancient bed. A little bit like a man playing a salmon. 
it is remarkable to see that this wonderful stone actually flexes with the leverage of the crowbar. It's a combination of ancient skill, experience and patience. Each quarry has its own pattern, depth and quality of stone. Some of the Liscana stone quarries at Moher were sited on top of the majestic cliffs. When taking it out from such locations, the men were biting down through the cliff face. On one occasion, when the workmen came back from a break, the shelf they had been working on had plunged 600 feet into the sea. The Moher men had got used to heights, and used their steady nerves to swing down the cliff face on Sugon ropes to take peregrine nestlings for the local gentry to pursue their falconry. By the end of the century, the only limiting factor on the development of the industry was the fact that Liscanner Harbour was too small. It was not unusual to see four schooners loading and offloading with six more at anchor in the bay waiting to enter the harbour. Boats were bigger and plying longer journeys, coming in with coal and Guinness and departing with loads of up to 150 tons of ready-dressed flags. Liscanner and the Moher area was now a lively scene with a thriving community. New houses were built for the workers and hundreds more men and boys were employed transporting the stone from the quarries. A steam traction engine, Huffing Billy, was used to bring dress stone along a specially strengthened four mile road from Moher to the harbour. Like in any busy port, there was a sense of adventure and small disaster as well. So much of the imported Guinness was drunk on shore by one crew that their ship, the schooner the Elizabeth MacLean, drifted out unmanned and, as local wags said, sank like a stone. The music and the romance of the stone was echoed in its local uses and the part it played in the west of Ireland. And this Canner Heartstone was the very centre, an altarpiece of the home, and sometimes a prized possession to be passed on as a dowry. the holes of the mighty. Some flags were used for flag dancing, where with a hollow underneath as a sound box, it resonated the wildness of the Irish music and the pounding boots. Sounds were knocked from the ancient stone that equaled any music of the spheres. business and activity. The great stone quarry at Dunagor supplied the local authorities in Britain with paving and the sets to bed the rails of their tramway systems. It seemed as if this industry would support all the small communities for many years to come. In 1891, contemporary reports indicated that there were labour difficulties with the local workmen. Industry representatives lobbied Clare County Council and government offices on the pressing need to develop the harbour and its hinterland. 
representatives from Messrs. Watson and Company, owners of Dunagore Quarry, railed against the inadequacy of the harbour, and yet they were quoted as being determined to work the industry for all it's worth. A senior partner of the company spoke to the county council about labour problems. The labourers will see it is more to their advantage to perform their day's work and earn a good day's hire than to be looking into newspapers and imagining that they've all sorts of grievances. Within eight years of his 1899 submission, Watson and Company, one of the biggest firms in the area, was in receivership. The huge quarry at Dunagore lay idle. The workers' cottages at the bleak heart of a deserted village. Great slabs of stone, once a great prize, lay in wild, disordered mounds. This beach is 200 million years old, ripples from the last tide of a great sea. Now cast in stone 600 feet over Galway Bay. The world of commerce and industry was about to be rocked by change. With the outbreak of the First World War, the trade in stone fell disastrously. Moving cargo by sea was dangerous and people destroyed more than they built. Tarmacadam and concrete had arrived. The demand spurred by the newly invented motor car. For more than half a century, the clean, clinical craze for modernism was to put Liss Scanner Stone out of face. But the skills never quite disappeared. Small-scale quarrying on privately owned farms was carried on during the lean times. The limitations of concrete, as well as its poor weathering qualities, have been exposed over the years. Liscanner Stone has had a rebirth. Skills were honed and passed down to unlock the treasures of the past from the citadels of the cliffs of Moher. Liscanner Stone satisfies the taste for natural materials with its look and feel of belonging, of having always been a fitting material wherever it is used. Its strength and beauty are again recognized. Once again, the quarries are ringing with the sound of the old tools. Liscanner stone is a continuity of skills and of time flowing together. A living antique that will always have its place.